Miami Heat, 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 Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Heat Beat Podcast. I'm your host, Carlo Navas. And with me today, I, we weren't sure. We talked before the show. I'm not sure if this is his maiden voyage or not. We have known each other for years. This may or may not be his maiden voyage. It, if it was, it was many years ago. Welcome back or welcome to the program. Wes Goldberg of Locked On Heat and many other places. Wes, my friend, how are you? Thrilled to be on here, man. I don't know if it's the first time or the subsequent time after the first time, but it's been a long time. So happy it's been to do a long it. time. Yeah. That's why we're happy for you to be back. You can find Wes. He's the editor of All You Can Heat. He's written for The Ringer. You've also had bylines at Forbes as well, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Mm -hmm. Look at this man. He's everywhere. He's a he's a basketball renaissance man writing for all the best publications. I do it. Yeah, he's he's, he's kind of the goat. I think you you dropped a story on Hawkes. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks ago for the ringer, right? That's right. You yeah, want to tell really people a little bit about that so they can go read it? Really enjoyed it. Uh, if you're a Heat fan and if you haven't read it, you, go read it. it. It's a must read. And I don't even say that as the person who wrote it. I just, I say that because Jaime was so generous with his time and the information and the stories that he shared. I talked to his dad, who was very generous, uh, his AAU coach, his college coach, a bunch of people around him. Uh, Eric Spolstra talked with him one-on-one uh, -on -one about Jaime and everybody was just so generous with the information that they shared with me and the stories and I think it just really paints a picture about Miami's rookie and uh, like it, it's a must read if you're a Heat fan it just is and I, again I think the writing was fine but it was really the stories that people shared with me that made the story. Wes don't be humble what is the best what is the one detail mm. give us half a detail so that people can go read the story. It is your pinned tweet on your Twitter account. Ooh, to pick one out of there. I don't know. I, I thought it was funny how um, his coach at UCLA, Mick Cronin, was telling me that, like, because of all the NIL stuff, uh, you know, they have, like, I guess, like, colleges do presentations, like PowerPoint presentations on here's how to use your social media and leverage it to get brand recognition and opportunities and, and all these side deals and all these things. And he, like is looking at Jaime Jaquez during the entire seminar. And like, he's like basically dozing off during it. He has absolutely no interest in like being on social media. And McCrone is like, he's not doing TikTok dances to get, to, to get internet ads or whatever. And he's like, nah, that guy's just a hooper kind of thing. And I don't know. I just, I, every time I was like learning all that stuff and he's a really, he, people look at his game now and they think like, oh, he's just a natural, like back to the basket footwork kind of Kobe disciple. And, Obviously, growing up in Southern California, he loved Kobe Bryant growing up. But, like, this whole, like, slow the game down playing like a vet thing is basically a year and a half old, two years old. Before that, he was sort of like a bull in the china shop, like, just always going too fast. Um, was just basically a hustle player with no real advanced skill. And over four years at UCLA, he honed his craft and turned into that player. And I found that really interesting. And so when he talked, when Mick Cronin's talking about Jaime kind of dozing off during like a NIL seminar, it's because he would have rather been in the gym working on his game. And so you hear all those stories and you're like, oh my God, you almost roll your eyes at how heat culture that he is before even having gotten to Miami. And um, it's why they've been such a great fit. So I just found all that very interesting. Match made in heaven. Uh, I'm surprised the ringer let you publish that considering how Bill Simmons complains daily weekly on his podcast how could such a player that is so perfect for that annoying team land in their lap i think he i think he said he cultures luck today i believe that was the uh the latest out of the bs podcast <laughs> i actually I, I i found a way to shoehorn bill simmons's own complaint into the story <laughs> and i was very happy with that so i've i've written like five or six pieces for the ringer about the miami heat now and i feel like i'm like the the freelance like mercenary that just deals like with the Miami heat topic for that website. Um, because nobody else on there, you know, Bill you, Simmons isn't going to write it, but you're yeah. holding it down. You are, you and Rohan are really the guys <laughs> that are just fighting the good fight. Now, Rohan half the time's a Celtic fan. We all know this. I know Ro is a friend of yours as well. And he frequents your show. Yeah. Ryan Cortez and I berate him daily. We say, you better not 
say anything nice about Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum today. Uh, I believe Marcus Smart was his avi for a good month uh, last year. So we're sick of him. But you are holding it down for the people. And everybody should go check out that piece on Jaime Hawkins Jr. Ryan Spavero, by the way, shout out to you in chat. Resubscribe with Prime saying, I, I hope David walks with a bowl of cereal. I don't get it. I don't cereal. get that either. I left that because I thought that was a, an inside joke from, from your pod. Jeez. I mean, if 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 it is, it's one from like five years ago where we used to do a segment called Cereal or Not Cereal. But man, that would be a deep cut. That's, that's, that's the that deepest is. cut. Jeez. Bronx Joker that's... says, you like my hoodie? Thanks. Alf gave it to me. So is, it was a gift from Alf. So shout out like to it. What is that? Eat like New Orleans president. French kind of situation? That's a, that's a pair product company that he works for. Oh, all right. Even better. So, yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about... The Heat, and uh, not not. Let's talk specifically about Terry Rozier because he's had a little bit of a rough going. I'd say to start with mm. the team, I think that he came in kind of the middle of arguably the worst stretch of basketball that they have played since they won 15 games, and that's not an easy situation for anybody. He comes in, he has to do. He's basically like a lead ball handler for them. He doesn't look great to start. I think he's put together some performances that he's been able to stack up on each other. Um, Wes, I do think that his finishing is just going to be a problem. It's always been a problem. I don't think he shot 60% at the rim a, a single year in his career. I don't think he shot over 57% uh, either. This year he's at 57.4. That is a career high for him, and it's pretty abysmal. What have you made of him lately? Because he's... I think he's found a little life. I think he's kind of found a little life operating in that mid-range area and kind of leveraging that. I think they started screening a little bit higher for him as well instead of kind of those low screen and rolls that they did. They're screening him a little bit higher, similar to Tyler, which lets him get a little bit of a head of steam. How do you feel that he's integrated so far? I think you nailed it. It was rough at, at the start, but that's hard, man. Like, not only if you're a lead point guard who is scoring 20 points per game for sort of a losing team in Charlotte, and you're going into a winning team with with stars like Jimmy and Bam, and you're the guy who ostensibly has to bring the ball up and get those guys the ball, guys you've never played with, just that by itself is tough. And then you get into a situation where this team is in a rut. And you're like, all right, like what am I really walking into here? It's a little strange. And then you don't have a real practice for a week and a half to even get to know these guys. Um, it was, it, and then you have to, you know, throw an all-star break into the middle of all of that, where everybody's away from the, the facility for a little while. It, it, it wasn't easy, but I'll say this, um, I, I'm pretty bullish on the fit still. I was bullish on the trade when it happened. I like it now. Uh, I, I think that, you know, you talk to guys, you talk to Eric Spolster and guys on the team and they'll, and I remember asking Spo this the other day, I was like, Hey, look, like you've basically turned over the entire point guard position mid-season you go from Kyle Lowry and Drew Smith to Kyle Lowry's traded Drew Smith's out with a season-ending injury to Terry Rozier and DeLon Wright like what kind of challenge is that and he basically pushed back on the notion that they were even like they even had a point guard and the point he was trying to make really is and Spo likes to kind of go extremes on these on, on these things a little bit but the point that he was making was a good one and it's like hey so many of the guys in this in our lineup will handle the ball that we don't really need to have a point guard and since then I've started to notice a little bit more how Terry Rozier, not only has he been differential to these guys like Jimmy and and Bam and even Duncan Robinson, um, but like he's kind of used as a second side attacker. And I kind of love that for him. Like he'll bring the ball up and run some high screen and roll to your point, like with Bam every once in a while. But when when it's Jimmy and Bam running that side pick and roll that they've been running or Duncan and Bam doing their two-man dribble handoff pick and roll stuff, Terry Rozier is very chill hanging out on the weak side, uh, like above the break on the weak side or whatever, waiting for the ball to come his way. And with his athleticism and his ability to get to the basket and draw fouls, if that's his job, I think that's a great job for him. He's also a really good catch-and-shoot three-point shooter. Uh, if you kind of sprinkle in those pull-up things with the high screen and roll, I think there's ways for him offensively to make, to make a difference. And just the fact that he is a threat to shoot and to score and to drive off of closeouts and do all those things and attack the basket – where Kyle Lowry really wasn't, that alone makes it more of like a less than not trying to attack to do. Slow down there. It's like, you know, we're trying to have a we're trying to have fun today. You know Kyle I mean? Lowry does a lot of things well that that Terry Rozier does not do well. But for the 
for what this offense needs, they just needed somebody who was a threat to take more uh, uh, attention off of Jimmy and Bam. And Terry Rozier does that. Defensively, we'll see what happens there. But um, I don't know. I, I think they're they're all starting to figure each other out, I guess, is the short way to say the long answer that I already said. They, man, so I was not really great on the fit because, again, I, I was really worried about his finishing numbers and I, I was worried about his defense. I think he's competed defensively. I do think that that's a problem. They don't close with him all the time, which mm. I think is actually like good. And I think that the fewer people that Spo feels that he needs to close with the better. I, I maybe I'm crazy Wes. I think that ultimately the only two guys that probably should close every game are Jimmy and bam. And the rest of the guys, it's like, well, who's, who's got it tonight. Does Duncan got it tonight? Or does Tyler got it tonight? Is tonight a Caleb night, which I also, I think you might've tweeted. Are you shooting like 60% post all-star break from three? Somebody tweeted that today. I didn't tweet that. Yeah. I, I was something, something insane. His percentage from three yeah. post all-star break, which would make sense. Cause he's been fantastic and he looks like himself again, probably, you know, doesn't look hammered by injury or whatever. But so I, I just think that given that context of like the, 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 the non-committalness of having to play him, I think helps their lineup flexibility. And I think he'll earn like spots to close. Like we saw the other night when, you know, he shot a few air balls, um, mm -hmm. a little, you know, poor, you know, he'll, he'll get there. I, I've really, I've turned on him because I do think that the downhill zip is real. I think that the shooting will come. I just don't believe he's like a 33% shooter. He's not. I mean, he's had seasons that he shot 40. I don't think he's like an elite shooter. I just think he can be like pretty good because I do think the looks he gets are good. I think a lot of the action comes off of help. And I think Miami's been exceptional lately at kind of getting in the paint and kind of getting those that guy who's one pass away from the corner. I think Duncan's been really, really good at that. Duncan's like very quietly, West is making like across his body passes, not to the corner, but to the wing. And I'm like, who are you? It's crazy what Duncan Robinson has done with his game. I don't understand how he's not really on the most improved thing. They ruined the most he won't, improved he thing won't a few be. years ago yeah. when John ja, ja Morant won it just for going from very good to great player. Like ever since then, they just ruined the award. The award's ruined. But he has been, in my opinion, the actually from a skill set perspective, ignoring uh, of like ignoring the stats and all that kind of stuff, just like the most improved player. It is crazy how he's transformed his game. Dude, you're so right about that award because he probably like he probably could have won it twice. Yeah. You know, because he didn't get it the other time when, I mean, he was just a demonstrably different player than he was. Because, he, you know, I think sometimes guys get awards because they got opportunity. That guy couldn't get on the court. That team that he was a part of was bad, and they needed shooting. It's not like that team had this wealth of shooters that right. could just be like, yeah, we could have this good shooter on the bench. That dude got so much better and had – Arguably the best non-Steph shooting season in the history of the sport. Didn't win the award. And now, I'm not even joking, Wes. This is this is actually not a joke. When teams were pressing them at the end of games, Eric Spolster was like, we need some sure ball handling and passing. Duncan Robinson, go in there and get the press. And I'm like, where? what have we, where, the we've come a long way. He, what was it, what was it, the, the Kings game where he went like, one for 12 or something shooting like he couldn't make he went over six or over seven from three point range but had 11 assists and, and one it's like, turnover and one turnover and it's like even like a few months ago duncan robinson if he started over two or over three from three point range he would have been pulled off the floor and he wouldn't have seen any playing time for the rest of the night now he's actually making a positive impact we gave him credit cookies for that win despite the fact that he didn't make yeah. a single three pointer like where are we now with duncan robinson it's crazy He's a complete player. His defense is, is better. And by the way, he's still shooting. His defense is 40 better. 40% from three. 40, 41 if you want to round up. His elite stat, his elite category is still his elite category. But he's just raised the floor on all the other things around it. He'll never be that 2020 season. I mean, he shot 45% on like eight right. or nine attempts. Like that's just, that was just lightning in a bottle. But what he is now is still an elite shooter off the dribble. I, I, I He's not like a crossover pull up kind of guy but he will pull up off the screen knock those down he's able to leverage that into getting to the basket and i think after like you know kind of the star guys you know he's really the most consistent guy getting to the basket and i think that's kind of funny with the team with tyler hero that's not to to besmirch hero but it's just kind of a credit to duncan robinson and how 
you know, he is a bigger guy than Tyler. He uses his size. He's a good finisher. He's he's shooting 68%, uh, 67% at the rim, excuse me, 74th percentile in the league while shooting 40% from three and, 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 and dishing it out the way he is. I'm just, bro, I'm so happy for my man. Uh, Wes, you know, I, I know that I didn't, you know, in the show sheet I gave you, I did not put Duncan Robinson, but how have you noticed kind of his attitude and his confidence, you know, this season as opposed to last season? Because I remember the first day of of, uh, of of the media day, Josh Richardson was giving out these little cards with like little inspirational things on it. And he gave one to Duncan about like, you know, talking like nice to yourself. He's like, you know, Dunk, Dunk's always hard on himself. And it, I thought that was like really telling because I think we all, even people that aren't, in the locker room see that like this guy is really hard on himself and even like his peers are like yeah man you gotta you know you, you you're you're there you, you'll get there how have you noticed kind of the way his teammates have talked to him the way that he has approached the season because i just feel like he is such a different person than he mm -hmm. was last season his confidence i've never seen it where it's at now like even just the way he's interacting with teammates and, and media in the locker room like he's joking with guys all the time um calling media out by like name but like not like not calling out like in a bad way just being like yo what like yeah Wes, like that's a that's a question i'm gonna answer it yeah whatever ira here you go Anthony. i, I was waiting go. for the like, ira for, yeah, for yeah. sure ira yeah 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 and like that wasn't like really a thing he was doing before that's sort of like when you start doing that you start flexing when you're like a coach or a player um it's it's like one of those like little subtle flex things that they do in front of the media uh, but he's doing that. I mean, I, I don't know. Like you could just tell, like he's carrying himself differently, and he should, man. Like the guys put the work in. Where, like, he's not just the guy who gets the pass and makes the three anymore. He's setting other guys up. I think that his, like, when he's setting other guys up, like Bam, like you mentioned the, his size and and the fact that it helps him defensively, and then some of the passes he makes, like some of his entry passes from high up on the floor, just best into Kevin team. Love or into Bam. Best on the team. Best on the team. And it's it's him being like six seven, six eight, whatever he is. That helps him do that. See over the top, just drop those passes right into the paint. Like Bam is really pouring into him now. Jimmy is really pouring into him now. Like all these guys are, and they see it, and then you know how the Heat are. Like if you put the work in, they're going to respect it. And the fact that he's gone through what he's gone through in terms of having the playing time, getting benched, basically a two-year shooting slump after this, after getting the contract, all that stuff to where he is now. Um, yeah, it's confidence level is awesome, and he's great he's to shot. be around. He's one of my favorite guys to talk to in that locker room. Dude. Uh, he is effervescent this yeah. season, which is just a shock. Last season, he shot 33% from three. That's crazy. A guy shot 45% and then got down to 33. That is all. It's just a testament to him getting back because I think there's a lot of stories of a lot of guys who have that year and don't get out, especially in a, in a, in a community, in an ecosystem as difficult and competitive as a Miami Heat ecosystem that other players that are, you know, will say like that thing chews you and spits you out. It's not. And they say all the time, we're not for everybody. And he responded when there were a lot of guys in front of him that, you know, deserve playing time like Tyler, like Max, like mm -hmm. Gabe, people that had some redundant skill sets. And he came out the other side, even in the playoff run last year. I remember that Milwaukee game. It was game two West and they were getting their ass kicked and he was on the floor when they made a run and they made the score respectable. That was a blowout, but in garbage time, he played great. And that kind of launched his new found his let's call it the second stint. Right? Yeah. I mean, you think of a guy like Tyler Johnson, for instance, who had a great year, year and a half for Miami. And then that was it, right? Like that. He just, he got played out of the rotation. He never got it back. It is really, really hard to do what it is that Duncan Robinson did, especially when you've got a guy like Max Strews come in and basically take your job, right? Yeah. And like, hey, I just, what all this stuff, stuff that you're Max doing, I'm doing Tyler. it better, right? It, it's like, I don't know. it, And yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. It's like, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable what he's done. And now what was maybe one of the worst contracts in the NBA that they could not trade has become a very, underpaid. very good value. Underpaid. A value, value deal. Contract. Value yeah. deal. We had we had uh, Jake Fisher come on below, be before the trade deadline and be like, and half jokingly, but kind of also like half serious, where it's like Duncan Robinson's contract is basically untradeable now, in the way that the Heat wouldn't trade it. It's like untouchable. Like, and he didn't it's mean so it crazy. to be untouchable, but that's that's how highly they regard him now, and as they should. And by the way, and I say this all the time whenever the Heat sign kind of a, a deal that looks a little funny, even even the Lowry deal, you don't get Rozier without the Lowry deal. 
mm-hmm. right? Because you need those size contracts to move because especially when you're operating over the cap, you, you're going to need to find ways to get players. And the way you do, it's why they gave Myers Leonard uh, that weird, whatever it was, $12 million yeah. deal so that they could try to move. Now that didn't work out, but you know, and everybody got mad at them. Uh, I'm old enough to remember, but you know, you need those deals and Duncan, not that they're going to trade Duncan, but you know, at that $19 million figure, um, that's, that's an attractive thing to have. If, if somebody really good becomes available and there's not a lot of years left on them and a team like, let's, let's use the Portland trailblazers. For example, if they were to have gotten a contract like that, you don't think a contender would be like, I'll take two years of that guy at that number. That sounds really yeah. nice. I'll give you some good stuff for that. You know, it's cheaper as opposed than the Tyler to- Hero contract, right? Yes. It is. And Duncan Robinson is just, he's not a better player than Tyler Hero, but he's an easier yeah. fit depending on what kind of core pieces you have. So if you're a team out there that has a star player, like Duncan Robinson's not going to be the cornerstone of like a package that you get for like Donovan Mitchell or something, but he could be a part of that as sort of the not get just you salary, salary filler. Yeah. Right. But he's but he's he's a value add into any trade package. Like if you're, again, I'll just use Cleveland as a hypothetical, like it's like, yeah, of course we can use a guy like Duncan Robinson, even though they already have Max Drews. So maybe not the best. That, that's that that's actually funny. That's like the one. <laughs> that's the one team that we've seen that. That would be weird. Hey, I'll try, shout out to Max. Somewhere else. Yeah, shout out to Max. Fifty nine footers, good for him. Took, took the culture with him. He did. First guy to ever bring culture to Cleveland. Can you believe it? Yeah, nobody else has done it. No one else has left the not Heat ever. to go play for Cleveland. No one, yeah. no, it's just never happened. There's no, no franchise icon has ever done that. Nope. Uh, Wes, speaking of franchise icons, Jimmy Butler is kind of hooping again. Jimmy, Jimmy looks like Jimmy. Now I have, you know, and I've said on our show that my concern with him and, you know, not to sound like a broken record, but I do look at finishing a lot and I look at what finishing tells us about a player and how they look and how they are athletically and how they're, you know, how that's mm-hmm. going to translate to the playoffs. Cause that's such an important part of the game. Jimmy is shooting a career worse at the rim. Um, yes. And that, except for his rookie year where he shot an abysmal 47%. Yikes. Uh, he's at 58% post all-star break less than five feet. He's about the same. So it's not even that since this recent stretch of him balling, it's not that he's shooting better at the rim. I think he's been blocked more this season already than he has ever in his career in any other full season, which is weird. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but it's just he gets blocked so often and it's always on the way up or it's always on the fake. And I had concern, Wes, and I was like, I know that he'll turn it up in the playoffs. He'll get to the level that we know that he can be at, but I don't know if he's going to be like he was last season where he was the best player in basketball. He might get to 85% of that, but is 85% of that enough to take them to where they want to get? And I guess that's what I've been asking all year. So he's playing a lot better now. He's active. He's aggressive. He's getting to the line. His jump shooting is better, particularly kind of that painted area. Um, But I don't know how to feel about him going forward. He's obviously an a one player and he'll be in all NBA conversations because of how good he's been the second half of the season. But, and his three point shooting that shooting, like what is he shooting on on the 40 freaking 6% on the Mm -hmm. year? I don't know how to feel about him post all-star break other than like, yeah, he's great, but is he going to, you know, where, how is this going to look in April? You and I are completely aligned on this. Um, It's the same thing we've been saying on our show. Um, Look, we know that he paces out. The regular season, right? He, the, before the All-Star break and then the post-All-Star break are two very different Jimmy Butlers. But even that said, the pre-All-Star break Jimmy Butler was worse than the pre-All-Star Jimmy break, All-Star break Jimmy Butler used to be, right? And that's not something you just like wipe away and say it doesn't matter until April. Like you can't, it doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. Like if you can, if you notice physical uh, uh, limitations that weren't there before, it's not like those physical limitations just go away. That said. Uh, there has been a ramp up. Jimmy Butler, I think, also knows this about his own body at 34 years old and maybe did take it a little bit easier than even he used to in the past. And he used that time during the All-Star break. They've been very cautious with all the injuries and things like that. He's missed some time here um, this season. And so there are things, there are indicators aren't good. You look at the the, the shooting numbers uh, like within three to five feet of the basket. Those are good. 
Uh, I look at dunks. I just look at dunks. Like how dunks, much are you dunking like the ball? Great. Yeah. Right. And and free throw attempts. I look at all that stuff. Like dunks are down. Uh, free throw attempts are, I think, are about the same. Even though those have been kind of ticking up lately. Like, the way looking, he gets them feels a little bit different, and that won't show up do. in a stat sheet. It just, right. It feels a little. It's forceful. a lot more baiting. It's a little bit. Yeah. It's a lot more baiting into those instead of just going in and knocking people over and getting the end one. Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely true. But I saw a couple of things this past week that made me think, oh, my gosh, uh, opponents should be scared. I can't remember which game it was. Was it the Portland game? Uh, it was one of those games, on the, maybe it was the New Orleans game, where he got the ball on the right wing, quick first step, drives, kind of goes to the baseline, and then hits the defender with that spin going to the baseline and then finishes at the basket. That's a playoff Jimmy move. That's literally a move that he breaks out only for the playoffs. And he broke it out a couple of times over this last week and a half. And I'm like, oh, boy, that dude's still we're got so that. Back. Yeah, we're, we're, like, we're so back. Like, that first step is there. Like, you don't hit that. And then you get, like, that little spicy P remix uh, baseline turnaround jumper. And, and, and you get that. He also has, like, I think if I thought of Jimmy Butler's, like, iconic offensive move, it would just be, like, running into a guy jumping over him and pushing the ball into the basket with yes. that right heart with the right arm and he's he's done that a lot more lately too and here's the other thing i know like the three-point shot is kind of like a fun storyline and it's almost like a novelty in a weird way with him but that matters right? he needs like, that no he needs that yeah and that's the way to extend your prime we've seen it with lebron right like lebron was like hey physically i'm not the same guy anymore i'm gonna start taking five six seven three-pointers a game and Jimmy Butler's obviously not there yet, but he's averaging the most. He's on pace to finish with, or he's already made more three pointers than he ever has in a Heat uniform. On pace to finish with the most threes made since 2018, 2019. And, and that was an anomaly year for him. Like he needs to be a three point shooter. It's a way to sort of preserve the body and not take so many hits and obviously get more points. And so if we're seeing that part of his game too, I think that's a huge development. So, I don't, I don't know that we can expect Jimmy Butler to all just like morph into Michael Jordan every playoffs. I think that'd be unfair. But I also think Bam Adebayo is better. Duncan Robinson is better. I think Tyler Hero is a better player than he was last year, and obviously he'll hopefully be available for this playoff run. Uh, you have Jaime Jaquez added into the mix. Uh, Caleb Martin as a proven playoff performer. I, I just think everybody is a little bit better around Jimmy Butler, and then you add the Terry Rozier sort of X factor because he could just go off for 18 to 23 points in any playoff game. And that just wasn't really something that they were getting last year um, from like that guard spot because, you know, Lowry wasn't really doing that and Tyler Hero was injured. So I don't know. I just, if everybody is like a little bit better and Jimmy Butler is just a little bit worse, I think that's a, I, I think that's an okay trade off. I think that they have more offensive upside and I think they have more. That. Yeah. Their defensive. I think their defensive peak is just not what it was. And I think, they play too many lineups where it's like two to three like ant defenders, mm -hmm. right? Like there's like a lot of love Duncan and Rozier or love hero and somebody, you know what I mean? But isn't it interesting that Spo's doing that? Because there's options. Like he could go with Haywood Highsmith more than he does. And he I, I get why they don't do the Highsmith thing. And I'm with I, you. It's just he, at times, if he's not like really good from that wing or corner, he can look so not a part of the offense that... Mm -hmm. There are times that teams just don't guard him as a role man. Playing four on five. Yeah, and he'll like stop like on the short roll. The Knicks do this to him. He like stops and he goes, wait a second. What do I do? It's yeah. bad. It's he picks bad. up his dribble. Yeah, but that's the point. Like I think three years ago, Spo would have been like, I don't care. I'm going with the guy who can get it done defensively. But Spo has been a lot more willing, I think this year more than any year, to be like, you know what? We just need offense. We score. just need offense. I'm going to play three guys who could score. That's why... Jovic gets in, in these starting lineups is because they just need some offense to start these games. Jovic is like one of the few guys who's creative and he'll mm -hmm. be like, fuck it, I'll try. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they don't like Bam doesn't do that. I think Tyler does that, but he's been out for so long. They just don't have, you know, and it's kind of sad because I think that's what like Kyle was supposed to do more of like, fuck it, I'll try. Because mm -hmm. that's like really what he, his whole career is fuck it, I'll try. But so yeah, you're right. I, I Wes, I just think that they've lost. So I think what Struess and, and Vincent gave them defensively, they they have not replaced. And not that Max was this like staunch, you know, lockdown guy, but when he's the weakest link in your lineup, you have a really, really potent defense. Gabe, I mean, not much to say about the best, ar arguably the best screen navigator on the team, just aggressive on ball, competed. Even when he got switched onto bigger guys, always fought. 
And I think you lose with Lowry, a guy that made plays, right? Like I think of that Bucks game uh, at the end of game five, they get a steal off an inbound. They don't get that without Kyle. And that that won them the game. If they don't win that game, I don't know what happens. And I think we all know we don't, none of us know what happens. And just think little things like that, that you lose that. I think Kevin Love will give you some playmaking, but I think we saw last playoff series too. Like against Boston, it's going to be hard to play him a lot against, you know, against some teams, it's going to be difficult to play Kevin Love a lot. And they're going to have to find ways to manipulate lineups so that, you know, because Robinson has to play, Hero has to play, and Rozier has to play. Jaime is not like an all defensive guy. I think he's like, okay. Mm -hmm. I think he's like Max. I think he's like Max. If he's your weak link, you have a really good defense. And not that he's going to get picked on, but he cannot be your third best defender in a lineup and expect to survive. And that's kind of where I'm concerned with them because they have too many guys that they got to play that are not like, okay, I don't got to worry about our defense in these lineups. And against, I mean, you've seen Boston's offense. I mean, it's just, and, and what Brunson can do to you, you know, beat you up and, and all. And and obviously with the Bucks, we know what they're capable of. Not that those teams scare me, but obviously like there are schematic concerns. There are. I'm a little less concerned about the defense, I think, than than you sound to be. Um, this team is not elite defensively, and they really haven't been, except for that uh, the one year where they were the one seed. This is not like typically an elite defensive team. I think we just associate the Miami Heat with being elite defensively. They've been very good. They've been like top ten, but they've never been like what Minnesota no, but is this year. It's the it's they they have that switch because they, they can have go the switch and they have the coaching exactly. Because and, they'll change the scheme yeah. depending on the opponent, and then they'll just be like, Trey Young, you're not going to do anything. Or, you and know, I, I think that's what Spo's betting on. I think Spo's is like, you know what? I'll, I'll just figure out. I'll dial up the defense in the playoffs. I'm going to figure it out. And I don't think he's wrong. Like, I, you, watch, you watch basketball across the league this year, and there's teams like Dallas that will put together just, like, dominant stretches of defense, not even just for, like, quarters. I mean, for, for games, for, for a couple of weeks at a time. And... They're starting Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving in their backcourt, and and a center who's at a least rookie. those guys have size. And, sure, but like <sighs> Kyrie Irving, like come on, like it's it's. I'm I'm just I think we we get we we harp on some of like the the personnel stuff, and this is sort of a new take, and this is less of like a hard fact that I have, and more of a hypothesis, right? I think we kind of focus so much on personnel and not enough on just like scheme, coaching, and communication because. You ask players and coaches, like, what do you need to do more defensively? And everybody will say, we need to communicate more. And I always, I was, like, for years writing that off as some, like, coaching cliche. And then I'm like, oh, actually, there's probably something to that because you watch these games, and when teams are on a string and they're communicating, it just it substitutes for so much of the personnel problems. And in a league where you have to score just a certain amount of points, you just have to get to this water level in terms of what you can do offensively, you're going to have to make that trade off that Spo has been recently deciding to make of, we just got to put dudes on the floor who could score because as as great of a coach as I am, I can't get the ball in the basket, but I can scheme us up defensively and have us prepared to stop like their first, second and third best actions. And that'll give us a leg up on that end or something like that. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm I not think that's a regular and... season. What you're talking about, I agree is a regular season thing, but I think in the playoffs when, you know, you're, you're going to get, you're going to have guys that are going to get put into actions over and over again communication doesn't make you get over the screen better. It might help you kind of, you know, hedge or stunt on the, on the, on the drive. But now, you know, that wing in that corner is a little more open. So sure. I think in the regular season, in the molasses of playing Charlotte and going to Phoenix and then playing Portland and then, you know, a warrior team that might be on, you know, four games and five nights, that'll, that communication stuff will get you through. But, you know, I, I just, I don't know. And I have concerns and I think the drop, I imagine that when rubber hits the road, they're going to go back to, to their switching, but I'm a little mm -hmm. concerned Wes as well. And, and, you know, we're running out of time here. We're trying to get out of here, but you know, they've gone to switching a couple times, particularly in the Boston and New York game recently. It looked atrocious, it looked absolutely mm -hmm. like, like yeah. unplayable. And I'm like, can they just like start doing that when they have to, or do we got to like, do we got to grind it? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm a little have, worried. 
they don't have the switch defenders, which is kind of a bummer considering that Bam Adebayo is probably the best switch defending center in the NBA when he's allowed to be. And they just don't have the personnel around him to run that scheme consistently uh, for all the reasons that you already mentioned. So it's it's a little weird that you have Bam, like this prototypical switched center, playing a ton of drop and zone this year, right? Where that's like, like, you know, at first blush, like you wouldn't think that that's what he should be doing. But because of the personnel around him, they have to do that. I'm with you on there. I think there's going to be games in the playoffs where Bam has to play. Like he's going to play 48 minutes. I, I and, and maybe you put him and Kevin Love together just for size. But we all know like the the defensive concerns of Kevin Love out there. But at least he gives you like a big body in certain matchups. Like it's going to have to change. I, I'm with you there. Can that man rest? <laughs> you got to let him rest. But um, I don't know. I, I hear that. I just you know, are you really going to stop Boston? Like offensively, you're not. You're gonna have. You just have I to hope that can. that team misses shots. Nah, yeah, I think you can. If you do, I, it's just getting into their heads, which is the only way that Miami could do it. But like, even if you have like the Knicks, for instance, like I think the Knicks and the Celtics would be a competitive series. And as great as OG Ananobi is, he's not stopping Boston's offense by himself. Not in today's league. Not with the rules just, the way they are. They're way too jump shot. They're way too happy jump shooting. And I think that the way that Miami overloads on the strong side of the ball. I think they can make Boston's life so difficult. I think that theoretically they can switch a lot of the guard guard and wing guard stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think if you can if you can survive and Tatum's not a guy that hunts. Tatum's not like LeBron or Kawhi or Jimmy that will find, okay, where's Duncan Robinson? Well, you are going, I'm going to eat you for lunch every possession. That's not that kind of guy that Tatum is. And Tatum would rather take a pull up than go to the basket, which is really kind of the the, the big question with him and that all they all have. So I, I think that their strategy of loading up and helping off of Jalen, I do think that Marcus Smart not being there is, is has made this a little bit more complicated because that mm-hmm. was another favorite guy of theirs to help off of. But I think they can do it off Derek White and other guys. And maybe Derek White made some pay and, and that's fine. Congratulations, Derek White. You won them the series and then you live with that. But I do think that there's ways that they can do it. I'm not as concerned as you are. I just think that I'm concerned. Not not, not concerned schematically. I'm concerned that like they don't got the horses. Mm-hmm. Because now you yeah, have I mean, guys to defend in space. Like you're like Duncan, Terry, Tyler, Kevin. You know, those are that's half your playoff rotation. Yeah. And those guys are not good defenders. And you need Jimmy to probably you're gonna have Jimmy guard either Jalen or Tatum. And that's just gonna be a lot for him to do on both ends. Like that's the problem with that that matchup. Maybe that might be like a Haywood Highsmith series. Holiday is such a problem uh, in that matchup too. Holiday like, is, do, but do does his Caleb shooting regress? Him? Does his shooting regress in the playoffs? Would be my big question if I were a Boston fan. Um look, I I'm not like, I'd bet on here. that. I'd help off of him. But I think I would off too. the drive, like what do you do? Do you put Caleb? Because like, you know, Jimmy spent time on him in, in the Buck series. You know, mm-hmm. what do you, you know, that that's a question. And then that's like, okay, well, Bam, Bam's gonna be in a drop, they're gonna play zone. There's a they have a lot of questions to answer for that series. And do they play again? Or no, that's it, right? They don't nope. play again. We're done. Three, three oh and three against the Celtics in the regular season. But that's that's bulletin board material for the playoffs for for the Heat. You all they, said we were 0 and 3. Don't. It's like, no, you were 0 and 3. Like that's, that's what happened. Oh, bro, that's so <laughs> annoying. I hate I hate when teams do that. <laughs> you guys counted us out. And I was like, you're an eight we, seed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What did you what were we supposed to do? Um, it can't bro, be the most improbable Wes, run I planned ever, a vacation. Also, yeah, I planned I booked, a vacation. I booked and paid for a vacation because oh, I was wow. so in in during the finals because I was so sure that an AC wasn't going to make the finals. Oh, so man. yeah, you put me on the bulletin board, Jimmy. There you go. No more vacations until July. Fucking, I was going to go to the Cape with my friends. We had we had a, we had a whole thing planned. It was going to be a great time. They they fucking ruined it. Instead, instead the Heat went all the way to the finals. <laughs> Yeah, it was just a weird watching experience because they're yeah. like, can you still go? Like, And I was like, I, I don't know. And then after game six, I was like, hell if I know. <laughs> Fucking dare yeah, play. that was strange. Wes, thank you so much for giving me your time and, and rocking with us here late on a Monday. Yep. Thank you for being great. I had yoga today, which is why we had a late start because uh, usually have yoga on Thursdays, but they play Dallas. And I Congrats on the uh, the flexibility and the mindfulness. Thank you. Listen, my, my hamstrings, not flexible. But other stuff, I'm great, bro. My sun Ayo. salutations, I'm fucking killing it. There was a guy next to me, way more fit than me, had like uh, uh, three times less body fat. My guy was struggling, and I was like, I'm fucking flying. I felt yeah. so good. As your cannot, warrior pose. 
Cannot touch. Great. Great. Cannot touch my toes, though. Can't touch your toes. But you my get, you're, you're rooted. You're things. rooted into the ground. Yeah. Good. Can't. Good but, but my shoulder stand today, my bridge. Ooh. I'm telling you, bro, we're, we're moving. We're moving. <laughs> Even my yoga instructor was like, I'm 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 impressed with the progress. And I go taking shout nuts. Out, shout out to Rosie. Shout out to Mint Body Studio on Instagram. If you guys want to check her out, she's a goat. Wes, appreciate you. Tell people where they can find you and our friend David Ramil, the <laughs> goat. Uh, Locked on Heat, YouTube, Spotify, all the places that you find podcasts. That's where we're at. Five days a week. Any stories upcoming that you might want to tease? Anything on the horizon? Man, I there was at that Jaime story was a lot of work. Uh, I'm I'm chilling, <laughs> I'm chilling for a little bit. I got some ideas. I got some ideas that I'm um that are percolating, sort of working on. But uh, when they are coming up, I'll I'll let you know. He's ruminating. He's ruminating. He'll come out with, with another banger. When you when you have another story, you got to come on. So we got to we got to promote and push we'll it. it. Heat Nation. Heat Nation needs the content. We need the national content. Wes. Again, my friend, bottom of my heart, thank you so much for joining us. Shout out to chat for rocking with us. Our schedule for the week, uh, we will be on for post game tomorrow against Detroit. Wednesday, I will play volleyball, so you are free of me. Thursday, uh, we will be uh, doing post game against Dallas. Friday is the Five Reasons Watch Party that I probably will go to, and I will probably do a post game show from the venue at Rock Esports Center. If you want to go and play me at Super Smash Brothers Melee and watch Ooh. basketball with me and Five Reasons, you should come and we will have a post game that night as well. Siobhan will host it or I will host it. Somebody will host it. But that is what the offerings are like for the week. And uh, again, thank you to Wes and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace.